Hello and welcome to the Jekyll Hyde Club. I'm Gomez and I'm here to show you my thoughts on the tarot. This is not a typical tarot review that you would find many times on YouTube. Most of the leading channels offer short brief reviews and I have some of those too but this is more along the guidelines of how to study tarot, how I think of it, how my thought processes as a reader, as an appreciator of art and as uh, my analytical mind goes through the various visual aspects of the tarot. So this is the Da Vinci Tarot and I posted a playlist of many other tarot decks that you can check out, studying tarot with Gomez. And this is uh, the tarot based on Leonardo da Vinci's works. Uh, the interesting thing about Leonardo da Vinci, as brilliant as he has been, he barely finished uh, any of his works. Many of them that were finished completely remain uh, in bad condition. So it's like, it was an interesting deck to work with. It sort of felt with even like I could uh, feel the energy from it of the unfinished project where I would work with that deck and go back and then return. So uh, that's how uh, I trust my instincts and the instincts tell me when it's the right time. Just like with other decks they all have their particular energy and this is another one which you don't have to think in terms of energy either just an interesting consideration for leonardo da vinci himself the deck was developed by atanasov and gusilov uh, in terms of reproducing the pictures and the explanations to it in the booklet i showed you were written by Mark McElroy, which you probably know from the Bright Idea deck and other decks. He is a very good writer, uh, creative approaches. Uh, sometimes I find them similar to my own, the way he works associatively with different concepts. So, without further ado, here's the Da Vinci deck itself, starting of course with a full card. Uh, this is the flying machine that Leonardo da Vinci considered. Uh, it's beautiful, uh, just it kind of introduces the deck ideally because it has all of the various aspects. First there's the visual, uh, which is important for some deck that is based on true art, like Da Vinci's. Second of all, it reproduces Leonardo's approach to life in a sense where he tries to observe life in its various forms and imitate it and improve it with his inventions which is a good uh, attitude for this deck, so that's why the readings with it are beneficial and appreciation of it is good. And uh, also it shows, um, uh, I guess that could also explain to you if you were never sure why some of the decks dedicated to the god Thoth, for example, the god of the scribes, uh, that is because a scribe has to reproduce faithfully exactly what he writes down. So here's uh, exactly how we are studying the tarot too. We are looking at what is there, try to imitate it, to observe it, and then to analyze it and translate it precisely. And that is the job of the scribe. So Da Vinci, in a sense, as an artist, he was doing something similar. He observed life in its various forms and then reproduced it and then made inventions that would imitate life. And the flying machine shows that he imitates life by trying to approximate how the bat flies, the laws of aerodynamics themselves. Uh, this full card is most uh, unusual because in most decks you see somebody going towards a building, approaching it. The fool who is always at the beginning of the deck, starting his journey, he's looking, he's divided often towards the building. In this case, uh, the rider weight concept is not preserved here. Instead, we have somebody flying over the building, which is an entirely new concept, and that makes it fun to study the deck because it features slightly different approach to life. It is an unusual perspective where the dangers, of course, of the flight, uh, harkening back to classical mythology of Icarus and Daedalus, is that you're going to fall if you're not careful. And on the other hand, you did come up with something that allows you maybe shortcuts to life. Shortcuts can be dangerous, shortcuts can be useful. It all depends on who is doing them and how carefully. And that is often the message of the fool. They're drawn to something, they need that something truly, but at the same time, they need to pay attention to what they're doing or else they're going to fall. And Da Vinci, and here is the reproduction, here is faithfully preserved. The building, to my mind, is reminiscent of the Sforza castle that we are also going to see later in the tower. This is not what the booklet says. 
But that's how I study the tarot. I don't only study the booklet, I also study the visual contrast, uh, each part by itself and how I make sense of it. And I think that is a good approach for intermediate to advanced readers where they can make up their own mind. They can rely on the booklet and the booklet is very thorough, so it's highly recommended to read it. But it provides a lot of the background for the paintings, which is fun if you just do it for the sake of the art. But if you want tarot, you need to find your own approach as well sometimes, which is what I do when I study tarot, visually. The next card, the Magician, it was originally John the Baptist and uh, it has become Bacchus after it was repainted uh, and then it was adapted for this tarot deck. The position is indicative how the entire body of that magician is held at a balance. It's well developed, but the curves uh, of the knees, of the hips, they are important. So we would observe those. They could become important when we gauge a certain situation. What if we're reading about career? Then we can see here a strong foundation for balance, for contrast, for conflict between the positioning of the step, between the legs, between the upper and the lower body, where they're directed different uh, directions, and that could be important when you read something. Um, on a symbolic plane, as it were, both John the Baptist and Bacchus have something in common. Both of them were said to represent certain powers of water, and we can call them transformative because John the Baptist with the act of baptism, he would transform something into something new from something old. And the same with Bacchus, of course, uh, Bacchus or Dionysus, the god of the wine, he was known for being able to transform one item into another like the magical equivalent of the transfiguration you would know from Harry Potter and similar works of uh, contemporary literature. So that is what the card of the magician is about. It's about transformation. It can represent psychologically creative solutions to new problems where the problem becomes something else, a learning or an experience or the ability to express yourself the best way possible. And that is also, of course, based on Da Vinci's work. Then we have the famous Mona Lisa. Uh, here she is the Pope, uh, the fake Pope, or also the High Priestess. Uh, it's like the Da Vinci series, Da Vinci's Angels and Demons, noted that one of the most important things about Da Vinci's works is the background to them. And here we see that the background is pastoral. It kind of represents uh, the true power behind the High Priestess. She's trying uh, presumably to channel that power into her work. We can see the traditional, we usually see High Priestess uh, with the two pillars of uh, knowledge and understanding. Uh, represented by Hebrew letters based on Arthur Waite's ideas. But here we see instead a different kind of contrast and the contrast is between the two parts of the papal crown over here. Uh, and that visually harkens back to our ideas of the High Priestess, of how she incorporates and synthesizes. In this case, the historical figure of the fake Pope or Pope Joan was based on one of the Sforza relatives, Manfreda Sforza, and being a female pope is of course an oxymoron in, in this lifetime, for a woman it is a heresy and such, but it shows us how entirely different opposing poles can be incorporated into a single entity, so we can approach the same thing from different opposing positions and still reach a complete understanding of it. Here on the Empress card for the first time, we see there is the sort of mirror reflection where the Empress is able to observe what's happening from the outside. Um, being able to observe means that she has power over it in this case. And there is a historical figure behind her too. Um, but it is just as important to remember to see such minute details as the folds of 
her skirt the way they turn different ways that could represent uh, different angles of looking at the situation and the way she's holding her wand and the way she's positioned da Vinci was known to play a lot with angles of movement uh, motion for people and those angles could be very crucial for a terror interpretation if you're doing that instead of just appreciating art at random for the emperor we have da Vinci's own patron Ludovico il Moro Sforza uh, you might remember him from some of the series uh, on Netflix such as uh, Borgia or Rain there were like or Da Vinci's Demons they were all indirectly mentioned in there uh, the some of the elements in the painting are said to be based on the allegory of the wolf the eagle and the boat by Da Vinci and it seems to be a political satire and for the sake of terror it could be interesting to review a bit the historical contrast because it was the time when the church had to maneuver the Italian church the Pope uh, presumably at this time it would have been Pope Borgia the famous Pope Alexander VI Borgia also known as Rodrigo Borgia trying to navigate his life around other competitors both in church uh, within Italy the Papal States trying to maneuver the Austro-Hungarian Emperor against the French King uh, Charles VI at the time possibly so uh, even the country elements uh, the eagle and the wolf the wolf represents the church according to a metaphor that was known already in da Vinci's own time about Pope Borgia and his rapacious appetites the eagle likely represents the Emperor it was the traditional symbol of the royal house of Habsburg that ruled Austria-Hungary at that time so here we see the ability to manipulate to use different elements to comprise them into a single picture that is the role of the Emperor in the traditional terror too where he has the larger vision he is the eagle who can see from above he is the cunning of the wolf he has the instinct the capacity the strength the determination and Ludovico Sforza himself had to maneuver a lot between different states the entire house of Sforza was involved in all kinds of intrigues several generations in a row and uh, on a cute note of course many of you would know that the one of the first uh, traditional tarot decks the Sforza Visconti that was the one designed by members of this household as well which uh, is a nice connection to da Vinci who served under this house then we have another interesting uh, hierophant figure it is uh, portrayed by Raphael of the Pope Julius II and uh, it is one of my favorite cards in the deck it doesn't seem like a lot it seems like a plain picture of an old man but there is a historical background behind it of course uh, Julius II used to be some some of you would recognize the name Giuliano della Rovere the great contemporary of Pope Borgia himself and like a true hierophant he has been through sick and thin he has turbulations he was a nephew of the Pope before he became the adversary of the Pope and the one who lost to him again and again in all kinds of intrigues and was outmaneuvered by him but then he was also the one who was able to defeat the Borgia eventually when he undermined the foundations of Cesare Borgia's empire so as such uh, Giuliano della Rovere or Julius II uh, sort of conveys the concept of the Hierophant who is not just somebody who teaches you a doctrine or anything they teach you practical knowledge based on the tribulations of their life and numerologically 5 and 10 are related so when you look at the Wheel of Fortune remember that uh, he experienced all kinds of vicissitudes of life and he came on top and that's how fortune also plays out at times and um, despite his plain appearance he was very striking according to contemporary witnesses when they saw Raphael's painting and the reason we include Raphael's painting is because presumably da Vinci started something similar that was maybe finished by Raphael Raphael seemed to be inspired by da Vinci 
and enough of the things we know about Da Vinci, they were only drawings or cartoons and they were completed by later writers, imitated by them, so for that reason they have been included in this deck. Uh, this is the card of the lovers. It's slightly different in Da Vinci's interpretation uh, than it is in many other decks. We see a greater kind of union. We often see the card of the lovers in traditional decks where there are two people separated and then there's somebody presiding and their union is represented often by a marriage ceremony that some kind of a priest is presiding over. In this case, this is not necessary because their bodies are so entwined that they already reach perfect union in a sense it represents da vinci's uh, own idea of how uh, genders blend together of how there is few boundaries uh, seems to be represented some would say his own taste where they bordered uh, on where he could go as far as any man of his time in his sexual proclivities if necessary, whether it's true or not, this seems unattested, undocumented, we don't know for sure. Uh, as far as tarot goes, symbolically, it of course represents perfect union between two opposites. The chariot is interesting, it's based on the war machine. It seems uh, one of those Da Vinci might have designed for Cesare Borgia's military troops. And it was possibly rumored to hurt as many people on the side that was using it as those of their enemies, but it was good for intimidation. So, as such, its historical context shows the balance, the double-edged sword, where you don't know what would be useful, what would be beneficial. Um, as a traditional chariot, we know how it represents movements, balance, uh, action and action type of thing, whether you should do something or should not do something. Uh, often we see uh, the chariot car depicted in different colors where one mount is white and the other is black. Here a similar point is expressed uh, with the contrast of the horses looking at each other. Often the horses are directed the same, sometimes they're not even horses but mystical creatures, but in this case it's still the same contrast, the balance, the initial conflict, maybe the eventual truth found from the synthesis of the conflicting opinions, and then the decision is made to move in the right direction. Here we have the figure of justice. Um, well, it's uh, interchangeable with strength. Uh, they're often 8 and 11. One can be as much as the other. What I like about this card is how this one shows the mirror reflection of Da Vinci himself in his old age where the woman holding the mirror is young. So, Naturally, it could represent that aspect of mere reflections where people reflect each other, where appearances can be deceptive. When perfect correspondence betwe between what you see and what you get is can be preserved, but not always is preserved. Because justice is, sometimes it's something you give yourself, sometimes it's the perfect correspondence between two values, where you can decide that it's not perfect, or you can decide that it is based on your emotional alignment with what is happening at the time so it's a very interesting card and uh, it's probably an entirely unrelated similarity but this card sort of reminds me of Lucrezia Borgia looks wise as far as she was portrayed at the time and Da Vinci could have known what she looked like because he visited Rome Here we have the Da Vinci rendition of Saint Jerome, and Saint Jerome could have been a perfect hermit. Uh, here he kind of reduced some of his features to the point where this he becomes almost like a beggar instead of the dignified somewhat position where they maintained him in other renditions of the hermit card or Saint Jerome himself. It's an interesting peculiarity that Saint Jerome was also known for 
taking out the stern of the lion's paw and the lion is known to be in the preceding card that is often strength. You probably know that the strength often comes with the maiden and the lion where the maiden represents the power and the strength is represented by the lion. So it is a very nice symmetry even though the lion is not included in here. Uh, the traditional hermit deck depicts uh, the hermit a little bit as father time with an hourglass which reminds us perhaps of the Saturn figure so this card is where you go perhaps into isolation just like Saint Jerome did and you find inner value you find something uh, that you were looking for and could not find when there was too much noise outside where there were distractions and outside of civilization for a hermit it's easier to find his path and that is what Saint Jerome was known for becoming one of the church fathers officially so that is also what hermits do when they find inner knowledge and inner guidance and then can guide others in turn on the wheel of fortune we have the slightly effeminate to my mind looking angel Gabriel uh, again this goes about Da Vinci's style because there were several versions of Angel Gabriel in previous artworks uh, several generations before Da Vinci and he would have been maybe familiar with some of them because some were done in Italy by masters of masters of his master so but this is specifically his style because he seems to blend genders a lot male and female and that is not coincidental in general for him, nor is it random in tarot to be included like that and reproduce faithfully. Because when those two genders unite, it is a concept of mythology, of symbolism, where two become one, of uh, the Hermetic Gospels, if you you want to go there. So there is lots of significance in it. Also, most uh, Wheel of Fortune tarot cards, they use... Uh, sort of two opposing forces to pull at the wheel and it is just as important as here we have only the one and it is specifically the angel Gabriel because he was also the one that was according to that particular lore responsible for saving uh, John the Baptist and Jesus and all kinds of other influential figures in biblical history uh, so with him ruling over the Wheel of Fortune, it becomes a rather benign influence and in a reading of this kind, even though Wheel of Fortune is supposed to be neutral enough and depending on the context, in this case I would interpret it often as more beneficial than not, but at the same time there is this aspect when you see this Wheel of Fortune it seems to have pretty sharp spikes out there which could remind somebody perhaps of the Iron Maiden since it was one of those devices, torture devices used in Da Vinci's time and such. So there is still the danger element so don't be misled by the benign influence there could be other aspects as well. Then we have the card of the strengths. Um, the Virgin Mary from uh, most of her renditions in Da Vinci's art in this deck were taken from the Annunciation picture uh, uh, motif rather in Christian lore and the line was added for emphasis but really well done the contrast between the Virgin leaning down and the lion's mouth open it's that conflict uh, I was describing earlier between power and strength the, the one who seems to be the weaker the innocent one usually she represents the power and the one that seems to be the fiercest the lion he is the strength that can be guided in this case um, it appears to me that the virgin mary has more masculine features instead her face is gentle enough but if I were asked which one of them is Angel Gabriel and which one of them is the Virgin Mary, I could say it could go either way. Maybe she's the more likely to be the male angel. Uh, and I think that it has been verified that Da Vinci has done a lot of ambiguous portraits and reused female figures to repaint them into male and such. So again, 
His flexibility with gender su should suggest to us that there is a possibility of interesting contrast in gender uh, if it's a very literal reading or symbolically if there is more than one possibility to view the situation. Uh, the Hangman, uh, a different slightly rendition based on the historical figure of Bernardino who participated in the assassination of Giuliano de' Medici, the brother of Lorenzo the Magnificent of Florence. Um, we know of the Medici house from many different sources based on Catherine de' Medici, some of you would remember her from Rain. The series that was the French branch, but there was also the Italian one before with Casimo Medici, great patron of the arts, and several Lorenzos. Uh, one of the Medici's even became a pope, Leo X. So it was an influential family, and the unique, I, I guess we can look at their own history in a sense and see how they could acquire different aspects of perspective themselves because they had such a turbulent history where first they're on top, then they have to deal with rebellions, with enemies from the inside, from the outside, from the papal uh, influence and other states like Milan. Uh, so at any rate, uh, the hangman himself is slightly different. We are used to seeing him being upside down so that he could change his perspective. and. In this case, he is hanging uh, upright, which proves that his perspective might be late in coming. It is one of the brutal renditions of the hangman. It shows that the perspective has to be changed through great effort, through lots of pain. It is reminiscent in part of the sacrifice made by Odin on the Tree of Life, trying to get the runes and how he hung there for nine and days and nine nights and such. So uh, this is one, some of them are more benign. This is not one of them. This is shows that the perspective will change. Maybe more factors will be revealed later on and it would be accompanied by great sacrifices emotionally, psychologically and such. So this could be a dangerous card uh, from the emotional point of view. Next, of course, we have the death card. Um, and it is based on another painting by Da Vinci of Envy, which is kind of interesting concept, the way he thinks of Envy uh, as or of death itself rather, uh, something that blocks the sunlight. There is this kind of a legend where that's how Envy came about, where she blocks the light of uh, the Lord or whatever. Uh, or you can think of it as the source or your inner powers, whatever else, but it's just an interesting concept, even if you're not religious, of course, or anything. So I kind of like that idea. It makes it a unique death card and it makes the Vinci a creative mind. Uh, from the visual perspective, it is not mentioned in this booklet that I showed you, even though it's thorough, uh, but that's because it's open to interpretation. I like to think of this wheel as crucial, uh, as uh, reminiscent in part of the fairy tales uh, with Sleeping Beauty when she has the spindle, and also Wheel of Fortune. So all of those ideas, uh, that would mean that if those ca two cards come together, Will of Fortune and Death, they will be related to this kind of a theme, where it is an arbitrary random factor, where something happens and you are temporarily blocked from seeing the truth or something you plan is not happening right now. So this could be that kind of an aspect. Um, and it's also interesting that to my visual appreciation her face appears to be more preserved than her other body parts uh, which could be important that shows uh, mind over matter and also her specific position is very interesting how the knee bends ready to leap so she's still spry she might uh, supposed to be death and all decayed and dying but at the same time she's not truly really, she has the capacity to move which is a reassuring if you feel like uh, you're emotionally hurt and you are still 
able to get up it's kind of a good uh, optimistic sign in the upright position for card number 14 we have temperance with again presumably angel gabriel based on lady of the rocks several of the gabriels are uh, here he is by himself with the chalice as is appropriate for uh, our temperance card but uh, of course the chalices here are added for emphasis to align it with the tarot energy as it were uh, but otherwise the normal associations apply temperance um, related possibly to temper as a vice uh, it requires you to endure during hardships uh, possibly well often related to the Aquarius constellation and all the myths that accompany them your interpretations of them they would allow you more depth to your reading the devil here is interesting da Vinci always believed that uh, hypothetical mystical beings could be represented by doing something that already exists and combining it and in a sense that often represents the idea of the devil card as uh, Alistair Carley once said the uh, black brother who does not really have cohesion or unity so the devil is often a composite image it does not originate in a single source usually all the renditions of God try to unify him somehow whether appropriately or not but all the different ideas of the devil are desperate from each other the different aspects so the devil in often represents confusion conflict this one is based on the dragon and the lion image and we'll see it recurrent throughout the deck many times this is a very potent image it has been used the dragon and the lion that is in many different mythologies um, there is for example even the one of the Swedish kings uh, maybe Knuth the second if memory serves at Uppsala um, he has this at his burial and uh, we also have the biblical references where both uh, Christ and the devil at times uh, sort of imply to be either one or the other so it's never that simple to establish which one is which and that's why there is confusion there is lack of clarity there is also the alchemical idea where there are different colors the lion and the dragon but sometimes they could be said on in select alchemical works to represent the union of uh, mercury and sulfur so that's kind of interesting but many of the times you would find it to represent confusion and I think in this one it also does then we have the tower that is the Sforza castle presumably uh, it is better preserved than many other towers that I've seen and once again as in many other towers we see the foundation entirely intact but the top is falling down it is often some kind of unpredictable uh, destruction of foundations something you're working towards might not uh, be entirely ruined but it could have a temporary setback and then you have to rise above and keep doing it and it would work next time if you're more careful that is sometimes the message of the tower and in this case it seems to be implied too because the foundation is strong and like Sforza family itself it has been surviving all kinds of calamities so it seems like a good enough sign just minus setback then we have the star and also based of course on one of da Vinci's paintings it's very interesting to note how the hair rises up here how the folds of the skirts and the position here it's supposed to be a dancer and as a dancer it's stuck in this position of lack of balance but the lack of balance is positive because it's reaching for the star it's reaching for something nice it's been inspired so it would be a good omen in a reading uh, a fellow twin dancer is in a different position here in the sun uh, the moon sorry and 
it would represent similar ideas except here instead of just being inspired it's guided by an instinct specifically so you could listen to your instinct if it tells you to do something and you don't even know why necessarily but you're drawn to it it could be uh, just wise to listen to it unless it's in the reverse position in which case it would mean that the instinct is betraying you and it's serving you false and it's telling you something that is not based on something you already experienced and not necessarily for good but sometimes for your learning experience and then we have the cute sun card with their two babies and it could represent encouraging the innocence the inner strength the inner child as the source of energy motivation joy in life and all kinds of other things and in reverse it could be uh, losing that kind of an inner child of course we have the judgment scene all the old men that are rising uh, answering the call of the angel they seem reminiscent of some of the old men we've seen before like uh, Saint Jerome and in that the card of the judgment could be uh, going together in some readings with the hermit card where the judgment might become clear after reevaluation what is happening in the situation it might feel like uh, being judged but in actuality it just bringing about something that already happened and just revealing it so and the message could become apparent from the hermit card they could very well work together because both are old men and such geometrical visual cues could be important for a tarot reading and then we have possibly the figure of Leda with the actual broken when her children as swans are born from her union with Zeus uh, most appropriate there are several hints here of this deck affiliation with the sign of Gemini and this is one of them because Leda it was the founder of that like third generation removed uh, uh, second generation removed from the, uh, the Gemini the brothers who gave rise to the sign of Gemini the Dioscuri, Castor and Pollux and we also have a similar incarnation of them later in James, uh, the Apostle, who is the son of Thunder, because he also had a brother, John. So there is several aspects here of the Gemini sign, so its influence is very strong, which uh, sort of creates this aspect of, on one hand, intellectual understanding, but it has to go through confusion, through... Um, divided perceptions that are not reliable in themselves and have to be contrasted and compared and such so this entire deck has that element and of course we know that the world often plays with that egg kind of a concept so it's appropriate choice for leather to have one here and that was the end of the major arcana the minor arcana uh, in the Da Vinci deck is also developed uh, fairly well. Uh, it doesn't have as bright of colors as some other decks, but at the same time it seems authentic to the tones of Da Vinci's art itself. Uh, in this example we have Eight of Wands and uh, the message here is clear with the guy visually pointing an arrow. An arrow is an obvious cue to Sagittarius and its encouragement of following your goals. The divided position uh, of the body here would point out that the ability to follow the goals, the means to follow them, could be in conflict with each other, that maybe you're not pursuing the best course of action towards your goals type of thing. So again, visual illustration and symbols, they sometimes guide the reading. And this one was an interesting one to show. So then we have another interesting sample of Minor Arcana, where there is uh, a baby with two kittens. And it's also borrowed from a famous scene uh, related to Christian lore, with the Virgin Mary being enclosed between stalactites and stalagmites, and we see their presence over here. 
and we don't have to believe in the Christian law or anything like that, but symbolically it is being caught between two opposites and the two opposites also represent are represented by those kittens that may look innocent but can grow into it since there are two kittens and two of those sharp things visually we can relate them to one another and maybe believe that this is how it begins it may look innocent but eventually if you don't take care of it it becomes something like that a problem that is not attended to for example so that's just an example of how visual interpretation can aid you without knowing anything about where this specific baby comes from what the meaning of the kittens is what the cave is just visual interpretation of a tarot card um, and it's uh, consistent on its own sake without relating it even to other decks of the Rider Waite system. And here is another possibility of interpretation. Here we see a king. He is supposed to represent Francesco Sforza, the father of Ludovico. And you can interpret this card based on what you know about his historical character, namely that he was not specifically the highest of the nobles himself, but he had the tactical acumen, followed in the footsteps of his father, another great tactician. So as such, he could represent again the vicissitudes of fortune because he went from being slightly above a commoner to somebody who by fortune and skill combined was given power uh, so you can interpret him historically like that or visually if you want there is also him being a king the king's power is either reflected in his position in this case it's pretty rigid so he is a solid king strong even Machiavelli mentions him as a strong leader which is definitely evident and allows him to be a king but also uh, sometimes visual aspects of the king's power are reflected by the throne. In some mythological decks the throne would be made of different kinds of specialized rocks with special mystical powers. There is, uh, for example, the Arthurian deck and the rock and the earth, they're all related as something that gives the king its symbolic power, recognizes the king to rule. Uh, in many mythologies, not just Celtic, uh, but also when you think of Greek or even the biblical one with David inheriting his power and being able to use rock to defeat Goliath. So uh, it's the bedrock of power. So pay attention to the throne. In the throne, we have this nice motif visually. So that could eventually guide the interpretation. It could suggest that the sail will be smooth but there will be obstacles along the way so look uh, always look at the throne when there's a king of one of the elements look what their throne looks like look also their position if you want visual and of course check what the king might be like historically if you can or mythologically or symbolically because that could enrich your reading yet another card of the swords here we see another boat and with that in mind we are brought to mind of card number four with the allegory of the wolf and the boat here we just see the wolf himself steering because uh, from this point of view everything is about instinct the wolf represents of course the instinctual power the instinctual guidance related to the moon so pay attention if the moon card comes along with it that will be the one ruling it um, it represents the power of the instinct uh, over logic so the instinct is the one providing the guidance and it can be more skillful than some logic because uh, Pope Borgia who is represented by the wolf in the political version of this allegory was definitely a skillful manipulator able to outmaneuver the best kings of his time the best rulers the best cardinals and that's why he essentially became the Pope so he was definitely somebody to learn from and as such he represents that instinctive guidance and another aspect of it in the reverse could be of course that Pope Borgia was known for some proclivities to physical pursuits so and this could represent in reverse that your instincts are guiding you towards sensual indulgence that you don't need to indulge right now so again both uh, 
both aspects, the positive and the reverse, could be sort of in play when looking at the historical context and the visual representation of it. As yet another approach to learning the tarot at large, or the Da Vinci specifically, here we have this minor arcana card, represented here Cecilia Galerani, uh, the mistress, the concubine of Doricus Sforza, herself barely above a commoner, she was very intelligent, uh, her mother was educated, she herself was educated, she was the one who introduced Da Vinci to some philosophy circles, and she is holding an ermine, which is supposed to be a type of a uh, stoat, uh, known for its purity, Da Vinci's bestiary in particular, the one that he composed based on his understanding of symbolism and such, was that it would rather die than allow itself to stain its purity, so this card represents pure dedication on one hand, to an ideal, perhaps, but also the ability to it also mentioned moderation in his best chair, so it represents the ability to remain pure without tainting yourself, but being also practically minded because this girl rose from middle to the top and now she is in that position of the mirror, which shows her considerable power, her acumen, her skills, and her luck all combined into one. And uh, the reason I'm using this card for illustrating the learning of the tarot is that this kind of a symbol, this little animal, could be found in a best chair. So another approach to studying Da Vinci and other medieval base decks would be understanding the symbolisms of the best chairs because they could be read on many symbolic levels as well. And of course, uh, she also co combines those visual representations, the folds of her skirt are set up in different angles and all of that it is minutia but as has been said before the devil is in the details in tarot it's definitely in every single detail the more you observe the more you can put into it i can definitely make uh, a lot out of uh, a few small comparisons of details and you don't have to be afraid of using your intuition even if it doesn't make sense but your intuition just guides you go with it and if you are wrong, you would at least learn in which way you are wrong and understand better how to use that visual cue type of thing. Because no visual cue is random, no symbolic cue is random, no motion or angle is random. A good deck, if it's not a good deck, it's one thing, but this kind of a deck, the one that is uh, doable for advanced readers that would use every detail very wisely, uh, every and especially Da Vinci would use that kind of thing efficiently, so that is another aspect. Then there is another aspect yet, another minor tarot from a different element of minor arcana. Uh, this one is to, supposed to be the rendition of Saint George slaying the dragon, and here you can look at it mythologically. Most of the deck here can be analyzed in terms of either Greek uh, or classical mythology, including the Romans, uh, or it could be analyzed in terms of biblical mythology, including the lives of the saints and the apostles and whatever else, and none of them have to be taken at face value, but they can be understood on symbolic levels, from Jesus to John the Baptist, as I explained earlier, or from uh, James, son of thunder, the apostle James the Greater. Uh, so here we have uh, this dragon that is slain down, so mythologically you can understand it as overcoming an obstacle. In visual terms, you can see how his face is still open in defiance, while his tail is curved up. That kind of a contest suggests that if you don't put that problem to rest, it could rise again, because the mouth is open to spring. Uh, then there's the twists of the tail. Visually, it could represent some kind of entanglement in reverse where you don't know, you know that you're supposed to face the problem, but you're not sure exactly how you would face it. This is not something that the booklet suggests. It is my visual uh, lesson in how to interpret tarot for you guys. And then there's another aspect yet where the problem is ready to be addressed and the fact that the lens here finds the exact precise spot to slay the dragon 
is also indicative. It shows that with clear initiative, the problem could be overcome easily. Then there are other aspects such as the positioning of the claws. Then there is another aspect that the wings on this dragon are absent and that is not necessarily common for medieval dragons. Many of them were based on the Welsh style and they did have the wings behind them like the famous Merlin dragon or the one that represents uh, Wales itself now. Uh, and then you could ask yourself how is it possible for example that this dragon is wingless and then you might remember that there were earlier Greek legends that preceded St. George. For example, Cadmus and the Ismanian dragon would be a good forerunner because there was a water dragon and for that reason it did not seem to have wings, it seemed to have seven crowns instead. So that kind of a combination of mythological, of historical, of visual. Also the fact here, uh, if we're looking in detail, that the horse's hunches are very strong so in some horses that would be being out of balance but in this one there's firm foundations which could allow you to combine the reading of this card perhaps with the card of the tower for example or possibly with even the fool because it also has a similar solid structure and the fact that the horse's head is raised and its hooves are ready to strike all of that is indicative again both mythologically, symbolically, visually, historically, however you prefer, and this card uh, in a sense combines all of them. And another interesting example, again, the dragon and the lion. So as I mentioned before in the other card of the devil, this one represents many different ideas. You can I recall perhaps the Chinese idea of the tiger and the dragon where they're supposedly in opposition to each other, the alchemical aspect of uh, red, uh, green dragon at times and a red lion. Again, their colors significant for alchemical potencies. There is uh, the biblical reference where the lion represents great strength and the dragon could represent cunning, for example, and then there are more than one biblical even. So, uh, be a sly as a serpent, uh, the serpent being the dragon in times too. So, uh, there are so many aspects uh, and the fact even that the dragon is sort of mounting the lion. It could be uh, reflecting back the idea of Da Vinci himself, of different genders, different composition of elements, the fact that the dragon's wings are folded, that the lion is rising back in defiance. All of those could be visually both stimulating on one hand, but also suggestive of different aspects of reading, how the two are in seeming conflict, how they could be reconciled, how the problem can be attacked from different angles and such. So, And then there's also, if you want to be really deep, there is the number five card, which numerologically could represent that it is about liberating yourself maybe from false perceptions. Some paradoxes are based on games that are not real and in reality, once you see the whole reality, you're free of such a paradox. So that could be even that element of the card. So this deck could be read in very many ways. And again, I would stress out the mythological, the symbolical, the historical context of real characters it's based on the paintings of Da Vinci and his views, his best chair is a good source, uh, the history of his art, all of that could be interesting. So those were different suggestions and now I'll just go quickly through the rest of the Minor Arcana to show you the beauties and this will conclude this review. And again as a reminder, many of them are based on either real historical figures or symbolic or either Italian or Greek or Roman myths or biblical ones. And it's basically a composition of all of them through the prism of an artist of Da Vinci's caliber, which makes this deck very interesting and fruitful for very deep interpretations. And some of this is based on historical events too. This is the Battle of Dengiari, but 
again you don't have to know what the concurrent inventions were always or what when the particular event took time or what it signified sometimes reading about it can give uh, a sense of energy sometimes i can read about th that kind of a battle and understand it was about conflict and confusion even without knowing the particulars and sometimes it is confirmed by the visual aspects of the card so that's always nice when you get confirmation from different sources historical and symbolical and then understand that you must be onto something here is another mythological one with a leather and the swan Then there's James the Apostle. Okay, so that concludes the Da Vinci deck. Here's the look into the booklet again. Uh, it has overall been a nice deck to work with, but uh, because of the different energies in it, it was uh, somewhat hard for me to study it all in one burst, so I had to leave it and return to it and that could be sometimes true for a reading um, when I do one I could go back to it and then get better insights while the unconscious processes and I have given you different clues and as to how to interpret this deck and on very different levels so through comparison with other decks so hope you enjoyed this review and I have several others in my playlist, Tarot Studies with Gomez, different decks from darker variety to metaphysical to inspiring to funny. So check them all out if you like more tarot and different gothic arts. And until then, stay spooky, my friends. <laughs>